Thank you for sustainability boards lecture on food waste and composting. Speakers tonight are Suzanne Lee, who's a food waste expert and faculty fellow at UMaine Arno, and Nate Cronauer, environmental educator with EcoMaine. Uh, prior to joining UMaine, Suzanne was an entrepreneurial business executive who launched and operated consumer product brands and businesses with both Fortune 100 companies and startups. Suzanne taught Maine, uh, Maine Business School or at Maine Business School for several years before joining the Mitchell Center's materials management team as a faculty fellow. These days, she leads student faculty team working directly with state business and community stakeholders, as well as national and global food waste experts to develop solutions to end food waste in Maine. Nate joined EcoMaine as an environmental educator in February 2022. He earned a BA at the University of Southern Maine in environmental planning and policy with a concentration on municipal solid waste management, where he focused on finding the best environmental and economic solutions to our food waste systems. Nate's prior work in the sustainable waste management industry has helped to develop his well-rounded and informed approach on how best to tackle current waste, the current waste sector and environmental problems. So very grateful to hear from both of them this evening. And we will, for those of us here, take some Q&A at the end. And then Vali will talk a little bit about some of our community climate action plan in town. And we will, this is being recorded for people who are watching at home and watching later as well. So thank you for our camera team here and uh, looking forward to the evening. So thank you very much and Susanna and Nate. Okay, so good evening again. And you know, I guess the introduction, I want to apologize. Yes, I did spend a lot of years in corporate. And so I think that I'm doing this work on Foodways now to sort of make up for all the <laughs> bad things that I did and all the many things I tried to sell to people. And now I'm telling you, stop buying all that stuff. So <laughs> anyway, so I'm at the University of Maine, the Mitchell Center for Sustainability Solutions. And in that area, we work with the state on trying to develop solutions for a wide variety of environmental issues. Um, and our approach to everything is that, you know, they're, written, they're never environmental only issues. There's money involved, there are people involved, and the impact on the environment. And so all the solutions that we develop we really try to focus on all three. So we're not about, hey, it's just, just the planet and we you spend whatever. I mean, usually do, I mean, always doing the right thing actually works out economically and for people and for the planet. So that's kind of how we do what we do. Ugh. This is really, there we go. Okay. So. It, raise your hand if you're already familiar with the problem of food waste, because then I won't go too much into the, so everybody is kind of, so you know, it's really a bad thing. About a third of what we produce, we never eat. And, you know, what I think is the only thing that I like to draw attention to is that everybody, you know, there's a lot of food waste, this 30%, but it's not just the amount of money that you waste when you waste that food, but it's all the resources that go into producing that food. And that's why I know a lot of people, we just did that home food waste challenge and people are like, I don't need to reduce because I compost everything. Well, but really, actually, the biggest way to sort of do your part for food waste is to reduce your consumption. Because when you are still bringing that food into your house, you know, and then you're not using it to eat and you're composting it, but you're, that water, 25% of the fresh water supply in the United States is going to produce food that we ultimately throw away or, you know, somehow process. So it's that. And then, of course, I mean, if you're not composting, you know, and you're having some kind of curbside, you're paying for that disposal fee. So people really don't think about you're paying three times, you know, you're sort of wasting this money. Um, so, and of all the food that we waste, the real tragedy is that 97% of it ends up in the landfill, where it does really the most damage. And the other sort of sad fact about food waste that is, came out of the research recently is that about 60% of what's in that uh, landfill is actually edible food. So it's perfectly, it would have been perfectly edible by somebody. This is not food that's molding and terrible and awful. It's food that could have been used to feed people. So that's really, you know, the ways in which this is a problem. Oops. Let's see if, okay. 
And here in Maine, you know, we're no different. I know we're very special here in Maine, but we actually still throw away, the, you know, this 30 to 40 percent of the food. The, if you go into our landfills, you'll see that the single largest element that's in the waste stream, which is why food waste is the project that our team is working on. We're materials management, but the worst part of it is that it's all food, or 30 percent is food, the largest part. And that at the same time, you know, we have this heritage in Maine of, you know, farming and fishing and all, you know, we, we grow things here, and yet we have the highest level of food insecurity in the New England states here in Maine. And um, one in five children, and I think actually some of the more recent statistics were even more grim after COVID, one in four children um, going hungry. And so, you know, this is, you know, the double problem here in Maine. We have hungry people and we're still wasting food. And, you know, we talk about food waste like that's just it. It's about the food that ends up in the trash. But really, the food that ends up in the trash is a symptom of a broken food system. You know, a circular food system would have food being grown, food being eaten, and then what's left over from that would be composted so that we could then use it on the soil so that we could grow more food, and that would be good. And so when we have this waste, I say it's sort of like a bad plumbing system in your house. You know, it's the symptom, like this food is spilling out at all these points of that food system. And that's, you know, the problem is that we, we need to fix that um, and not lose it. Um, the average U.S. family throws out about $1,800. It's actually closer now over 2000 with inflation. Um, the majority, you know, people like to think that this is maybe a business problem. It's like institutional somehow, this food waste, you know, restaurants, it must be the restaurants. No, it's actually in our homes. The majority of the food waste is happening at home. Um, this Best Buy labeling, I don't know if you guys are familiar with that whole issue, but that these labels that have the dates on them, that some people organize their cu cupboards and their refrigerators just by looking at the date and throwing out anything after is totally something that corporate America, yes, you know, I was part of that. You know, the, the dates don't mean anything really, except for on baby formula is the only category of food. And, you know, some of the fresh, you know, meats you probably want to pay more attention to. But the date labels are confusing. They were really started as an inventory control issue after World War II. It came about because there were no longer mom and pop grocery stores. They started having grocery chains. The people weren't as familiar with the inventory, so the manufacturers needed to put some dates on them to help the retailers manage that. Consumers started thinking that those secret codes had some meaning, so the smart you know, consumer products people said, oh, we should really make them very consumer friendly. Let's put these very readable dates on them. And, you know, and I know that when we were developing products um, in, in the grocery industry, the, the standard was, okay, the potato chip today tastes perfect. I think that on this next day, it doesn't taste quite as good as it did the day before. And that's really basically what people have now come to believe is some sort of a health issue. So it's really, you know, again, so we lose a lot of food that way. I think uh, Congresswoman Pingree is working on this, trying to get some uniform date labeling to really help this issue, because I think about 20% of the food waste problem could be addressed by the date labeling piece. Um, perfect produce standards, you know, Strangely, it never makes sense to me. People go to farmers markets and they're like so charmed by all the interesting looking produce, but somehow that when you go to the grocery store, you want every cucumber to look just like this and you want every potato to be just at the right size and anything odd becomes a second and really likely for disposal. Um, you know, as I said before, you know, the majority of food now we're finding was nutritious consumable food that's in food waste. And that, you know, another really uh, interesting, they did a study in uh, Denver, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, and that there's the untapped food potential, food donation potential could actually cut hunger by 50%. So in a given city, there's so much food that could be donated by restaurants, bakeries, you know, food producers. Re grocery stores are the biggest part of it. So, you know, I know here Hannaford, you know, does actually do a lot of food donation, but there are a lot of grocery stores that don't. They don't want to take the labor required to cull out and to set it aside. So, you know, they did the study and found that if you would donate more, you could really do and put a big dent in the hunger issue. Um, 
So the other, you know, problem about food waste, I mean, another way to look at it is, you know, it's as a contributor to climate change and that, you know, this if food waste were a country, it's the third largest producer of greenhouse gases after the U.S. and China. Um, you know, they say in terms of absolute amounts, I think it's about 8% of the greenhouse gases by food, but the more recent studies have sort of tried to add in the impact of packaging, the impact of transporting that food, and so if you really sort of total it up, the amount of greenhouse gases um, that it's causing are even greater. So, you know, food systems now, they're looking at it as a food system accounts for a third of the global greenhouse gases. So that's also some of the new research. Um, the, you know, another, you know, the U.S. food uh, waste generates greenhouse gases, I thought this was interesting, to 32.6 million cars and more than the airline industry. You know, we in, in the state with our climate action plan did not include food waste in it. You know, it was really the focus was on cars and transportation and things like that, you know, along with um, home heating. but. Really, we hope that when they're updating the plan, they will take into account. Um, and we have a whole big thing we're doing at our Food Waste Summit on how you can make your climate action plan and food waste really be, you know, sort of two birds with one stone. So uh, we hope that we can do that with the state. Um, and driven to waste, um, food, well, that was the one, you know, that actually it's much higher than the 8%. So let's see. Oh, yeah, you had a question? Um, do those numbers, um, are they pretty similar in Maine? Has a study been done that's Maine specific? Um, about the greenhouse gases admitted here? No, I mean, I think it's, we follow along with the amount of waste and the amount of waste generates this amount of greenhouse gases. So I would say that relatively, yeah, I mean, we're not, unfortunately, we hope, and we hope that with this work, with you people, you know, here and caring about it, that we will start to change it so that Maine will not reflect the national average, but right now, unfortunately, it does. So, so but very good question because, you know, why act, why now? And, you know, we really think that, you know, climate change, food waste, these are really big challenges, food insecurity, you know, and that there are, the solutions are here now, and they're not high-tech solutions. They're nothing that really needs, you know, somebody to come in, you don't have to pay. It's really things that where people can actually make the difference. And so, you know, one of the biggest things I've been working on just recently, last week, actually, I did these assemblies with uh, the K through five with elementary schools. And, you know, it's amazing to talk to these little kids and they get it that they can make a difference. And, you know, they, after we gave them the talk about food waste, you know, they were there in the cafeteria showing me their clean trays, you know, like we ate it all, you know, we're not, we're not wasting food anymore. And so, I mean, if they can do it, I guess, you know, all the grown ups can do it also. <laughs> so you can make the difference. Um, as I said, you know, if, if that sort of the grimness of uh, food waste doesn't grab you alone, we could talk about the solutions and the triple bottom line benefits, you know, that come from addressing food waste. So really these solutions do save money. Actually, there are new industries that can also be developed around, you know, um, reducing food waste. It's benefits people, as we said, because there's a lot of hungry people and this paying attention to our food system actually can feed more people and the greenhouse gases, not to mention the leachate from the, from the landfills that are threatening water here in Maine and how many of us have, you know, wells in our yard that we don't really want to think about that. Um, so all of these are benefits that come from ending or even reducing food waste. Um, you know, because of the importance of the food system and addressing this, when we started this work in 2019 at the university, we actually had all of these organizations and many more interested in working with us to try to address the problem. And so, you know, we feel good that it's, there's a positive future in terms of food waste solutions here in Maine because you know, it, to me it was quite amazing to see that so many organizations and people would really want to be involved in the project. 
Um, you know, this is just to say another important piece. So those stakeholders were sort of a piece of working on the solution. Another important thing, and, and this is really, I don't know that everybody pays attention to this either, but this is the food waste sort of hierarchy. And so again, when we did our food challenge and we've done some other programs, people say, well, you know, I'm composting, so it's really okay because in the end, my food doesn't really go to waste. But this is the hierarchy of solutions, starting with reducing, you know, the waste of food. Because again, that's where you get the biggest bang for the buck because you're not wasting the water, you're not wasting the soil, you're not wasting all that labor, you know, and the cost of labor now that's going in to produce food. And, you know, it's great that you compost it at the end, but really it would have been better to, to only buy what you need and then actually, if you have that excess food, to feed other people with it. So either to donate it somewhere, bring it to a soup kitchen, bring it to a food pantry, but get it to where people could be eating it would be actually higher in the hierarchy. And then feeding animals. So like some of our schools, you know, they're giving, you know, before composting, before garbage to garden, they're actually finding a pig farmer who wants those scraps or chickens, you know, they're so popular now. Chickens love these food scraps. So, um, so all that's better. And then, of course, yes, composting or anaerobic digestion is all better than putting it in the trash. But it really is that order that we should pay attention to. Do you have a question? Oh, thank you. How do you actually change the behavior of people like me? <laughs> how, how do you actually change the don't buy as much, eat what's in your refrigerator? Is, are there any studies about how that works? What's the behavioral trick? What are the behavioral messagings? Yes, there's a lot, and that's why we just did that home food waste challenge because we tried to apply all of the things that oh. we that the research showed us. You know, that's why we had it for four weeks. So when you want to change behavior, you have people, you know, repeating. So that we were having them track and measure their food waste to try to reduce it. We were giving them tips and encouragement, and it, there was an element of challenge to it, like a competition. We had a leaderboard. And um, so, you know, and again, the practiced habit. So I think that all of that is supposed to help. You're supposed to have some motivation. Then you're supposed to have some, um, what is it, motivation and opportunity. I think I'm missing one piece of it. But, you know, there are these components to learning a new behavior. But a lot of it is just repeated and first having the interest, like, why is this a problem? So. So that's why by being here tonight, hopefully you'll sense some of what the issue is. And then, you know, I'm going to, we're going to talk about different things that you can do yourself to reduce that waste. It's not actually that hard. And, um, and then, you know, the good feeling that you have from saving money, you know, you won't have to shop as much. You won't have to lug all this, you know, food scraps out to your compost pile because you'll just have a much better, I mean, you can start your own circular food system right in your home. And, um, but start with reducing. You know, you can't recycle our way to goodness is what we say. Um, so these are the big six. So these are the solutions. And we talk about them as the big six, and we thought of them sort of statewide. These are the six integrated things that the state needs to do to reduce food waste. But the more I keep repeating it, and the more I'm working like with home, you know, like with residents, I realize it's not any different at the state level or in your home. It's the same thing. So the where you should really start is with this tracking and measuring because a lot of people don't really realize the magnitude of what they're wasting. And so once they start to see, hey, this is really a lot of food. And you start to look at what you've been collecting and you say, it's a lot of bread. Like, why am I throwing away? Like, I'm going to the store buying bread and then I'm throwing, or I'm buying berries. That's a really good one, right? The strawberries and the blueberries. I buy them, I throw them away. I buy them, I throw them away because they rot in like a day. And so, you know, you can see what you're collecting and then you could start developing a strategy for, you know, utilizing it better, storing it better, or if you really can't store them, don't buy them because you're just going to throw them away. So solution one is all about that. Solution two is creating a food rescue system statewide. And the idea with that is simply we have excess food in some categories. You know, during the harvest seasons here, there's a lot of excess produce and things like that. And it's good today and it needs to be picked today. And people are hungry today. So the food rescue is just simply trying to get where excess is to where it's needed. You know, school cafeteria, I mean, uh, university cafeterias are a lot like that. 
they make up, or hospitals make up trays of food that don't get utilized. And so really, if you can have volunteers, so this food rescue system that we're promoting is basically based on zip code and everybody, donors, you know, food donors, volunteers, and feeding sites are all within like a 30 mile radius of each other. And it's a software program and you can literally just program in the food donations, you can put in your volunteers, and then you can put in your feeding sites and the program actually automatically schedules rescues. So you have a calendar of a week and these rescues will pop up. Your volunteers can just simply see and claim a rescue. And you know, the volunteer can say, you know, I have some extra time this week. Yeah that's a good time slot, 30 minutes, no problem. I'm helping out and getting food from where it's available to where it's needed. So, you know, we work with main feeding partners, the people who, the, it's the emergency um, feeding agency. And they have said, you know, if we as a state could really adopt this kind of rescuing for the whole state, I mean, it would really be a game changer because we do have surplus in areas. It's just as a state that's kind of big and like big you know, areas that are not covered, transportation is hard. So this kind of system could really help move food to where it's needed more smoothly. So we're really big on that. Solution three is education. So that's why I'm here tonight, um, you know, that you to begin to make a change, to change that behavior, you need to sort of understand why it's a problem and what can you do about it. So hopefully that will happen tonight. Um, solution four, again, you know, we talk about build, building Maine's food processing infrastructure and what that means is if we could, you know, take more of the surplus when we have too many tomatoes or too many zucchini and actually freeze it or we could process it into tomato sauce, you know, then we could keep it. But it's exactly what hap should happen in your home. You know, you bought way too many of those pears and they all ripened all in one minute. So if you could put them all and make some kind of a pear butter out of it, you know, that would be a good way to keep it. It, you have your own food processing infrastructure right in your own home. The same thing with those berries, you know, throw them in the pancake batter and make up some pancakes and then you're all good. It doesn't matter if they're mushy, it'll taste delicious anyway. So, you know, we should do that on the state level and it's something that works in your home. Um, increased food donation, you know, again, that works certainly in, uh, you know, in communities, but it's in your own home. You bought, you bought that three packs of bread at Sam's Club and you're not really gonna eat all three packs of that bread, so take the two that you're not really going to eat and go and donate them somewhere, so, you know, before they get to go to waste. And then also um, removing food waste from landfill, so that diversion um, aspect is super important. So, okay. I'm not speaking fast enough, so let me keep going. So, so those are the six solutions, and what we are doing at the university is to work with those stakeholders that you saw to test out these different solutions. We, we started doing them at the business level, so this was during COVID when we started. We wanted to do the food waste tracking, but there weren't a lot of food service. You know, restaurants were closing down. People were not congregate eating anymore because you were supposed to stay home. So we had a hard time figuring out who to do a food waste study with. But then the Department of Corrections, the prison system, stepped up and said, okay, we'll, we'll do that study because we're still feeding people every day. And so it was terrific to see that with this food waste tracking, and they, you know, you should be very proud of our prison system, actually, from the food system standpoint, because they really are on top of both feeding, you know, um, in the right way, they grow their own food, so they're super cost effective, and waste is not anything that they want, so they worked with us on the study, and we did things like with teaching them, we figured out about meal prep and about menu selection that could really cut down on waste. And so they were already doing a good job and they're now doing an even better job. And it's a lot of things that you could be doing in your own home. Oops. Um, so this is one of our students working in the kitchens there. And you know, it was a simple chart. I mean, you know, it's just pencil and paper keeping track of the food waste every day, like we had consumers do in January for the home food waste tracker. And this is a little look at that tracker. And you know, if you missed it, it was a four week challenge, it was really great. But you could do it at any point. And the simplest thing is, even if you don't wanna get too involved, just try for a week taking food out of your trash and see for yourself what it is that's getting wasted mostly and how much you're wasting. And you know, let that guide you to take some action is basically the idea. And 
Oh, I did want to share, I guess, when I talked with Valley about, you know, things you could do. And so this is what we gave in our challenge. You know, each week of the challenge, we gave them tips to help address what the biggest problems of waste were. And so the first sort of general tip is, you know, that people were not planning their meals. Like, I bought all this stuff and then I didn't eat it. You know, we went out to dinner instead. Or, you know, I went to the grocery store and I bought too much. So a lot of this, you know, creating an eat this first section in your refrigerator is a really good thing. That's the stuff that's about to go back that you need to use. It's what they do in restaurants a lot, you know, the special of the day. So what's at your house, the special of the day, the stuff that's not going to be good tomorrow, put it all in one place. You know, shop your fridge first is one of the biggest things. You know, you're putting, you think you don't have it, but if you would shop your fridge first, you would actually see what you have and it wouldn't end up going to waste. Um, and do always shop with a, a grocery shopping list. Um, you know, t for week two, it was a lot, there was a lot of spoiled vegetables and fruits. And so store better and waste less. So we gave them some, um, there's a really great app that, it tells you for any food what the timeline, like how long you should actually be able to keep that in your refrigerator. Um, you know, it t also talks about the different ways that you can store them to keep better different fruits and vegetables need different ways of storage. So that's what this was all about. And then actually one of the most fun ways is this recipes, like when you have that, use this first, you, there's actually an, an app that's so much fun. You could put what those ingredients are that you have in your refrigerator, and it gives you this whole selection of recipes that you can use to use up the things you have left over. Um, solution two, just to quickly whip through the rest of it, we did. We have been working on this food rescue system. So we, one of our students did a pilot in Biddeford from like zero, no food rescue going on, to actually getting volunteers, getting the food from UNE, it was at UNE, and bringing it to the pantry in town on a system. So we went from wasting that food at the university, the pantry not benefiting from it, to putting in place the system and, you know, rescuing, you know, it is 150 meals over this course of just one month. Um, we're working now on some community fridge programs, also to sort of try to increase food rescue and donation. Um, we do a lot of community education. Our website is just full of all sorts of resources. You don't have to oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. I don't want to keep you here all night. I told you I could really talk a long time. Um, <laughs> so, okay. So community education, um, like I said, one of the big things is the school food waste study that we're doing now it's in Buxton, uh, Lisbon, uh, Reed, uh, no, Orono, and Sebago are the four elementary schools that we're working with and we're doing a bunch of interventions, you know, getting them to use only reusable uh, service and meal items instead of all the plastics. The more plastics and packaging you have with the food, the more kids are likely to throw it away. Um, we just did those assemblies last week, so we explained to them about you know, the problem with food waste. We are also, we're doing sorting lines, so they're learning, okay, silverware goes here, liquids get poured off separately from, you know, you don't throw away milk containers with the milk inside, and then you get to the trash, you know, stop, and then you go uh, to the food scraps. And so, and one of the, the most amazing things that's been so fantastic is we have the fifth graders in these schools are the helpers on the program. And in some cases, the schools were not all on board with this. They were like, no, like the, our kids are not really good with this kind of stuff and they're not really responsible and they're just fifth graders, what do you want from them? And the schools themselves have really been blown away by the capacity I'm super impressed too, of these students to really get on board with this, help the younger students in that sorting line, explain to the younger students why it's important, and then they even take the weights we have with all those schools, they have a scale to measure every day their food waste and their liquid weight, and these kids are there and taking those measures, you know, and reporting them back to us. So it's really been a great sort of empowering thing, and to see, you know, it really makes you feel good about the future. Um, you know, of our state to see these kids in action. So that has been, uh-oh. So every child that goes to school ends up with a helping of all the food groups, whether yes. they like them or not. And that's a great initiative in terms of wellness and educating yes. kids yes. to eat all of the food groups, including the vegetables and the fruits. Yes. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is that the kids 
don't eat that food. Yes. And they just throw it out. And we know that they won't eat it, but we are forced yes. to serve it. Well, so what are you seeing yes. and what is the way out of that dilemma? I'm so dilemma? glad that you asked me this because this is exactly what the study is about. So, you know, but there's a lot of misinformation about what needs to happen in the schools because, you know, nobody wants, the nutritionists want these kids, it's not going to help their nutrition if they're throwing it away. So first of all, it's really important to offer choice. So there's the, something called offer versus serve. And, you know, all the studies have shown that offer is much better than serve. So you need to have a choice. They are required to take three items. So a meal is three to five items. And you have to take a minimum of three. And one of those must be a fruit or a vegetable. So that that's all. I mean, they don't have to fill up every one of those compartments on their tray. They have to take three. And so this is what we were just, because because even the kids, the kids didn't know this, the teachers didn't know this. And the only mandate is it has to be a fruit or a vegetable. And when you can give the child a choice, and you know, even simple things like apples, instead of serving them whole apples, and it's not even that the children don't want the apple. It's just like for in the elementary schools, it's a little daunting in the space of your lunch hour to try to figure out as a small child what to do with this apple. So when they cut them in half and sprinkle a little cinnamon or cut them up into slices and put a little cinnamon, it's a game changer. First of all, you're not wasting the whole apple at once, you know, and the kids actually eat them because they are something you could eat in time. So, so using offer versus serve is a big thing. Making sure that the kids understand that you don't have to take a milk. You can take a milk if you're going to drink it, but you don't have to. You need three components. So you can have a milk and you can have the pizza and then, but you must have a fruit or vegetable. So part of that big waste is the kids are loading it up because, and a lot of times the, the food service staff thinks that the children need to have all this on their plate, but they don't actually. So part of what we've been doing is trying to work on that education level too. So does that help? That yeah. I mean, what you're saying is exactly true, and that has been the thing we've been working on with the schools is that they think that the USDA requires all this. And one of the biggest things we've been working with the health, with the health department, because some of the schools have thought that a share basket, I don't know if you're familiar with the concept, but there's a, it's actually part of, it's been legislated. It's been ruled that in the state, share baskets are something that must be available at lunchtime for kids to be able to put food that they didn't touch, that they don't want, like they, they somehow took that milk, but they have no intention of drinking it and they don't want it, and that can be put in the share basket. You know, the apple that they didn't use, the anything that's packaged, the, you know, factory package that hasn't been opened, that can all go in the share basket. But actually when we started meeting with the schools, half of the schools thought that share baskets were illegal and the other half thought they were okay. COVID, of course, confused a lot of that. So it's not that people just didn't know. I think they were sort of uncertain. Are like we done with the COVID rules and are we back to normal? So one of the things we've been doing is, yes, share baskets are back in. And, um, and actually, I had one nutrition director say, I've been doing this for 30 years, and she wasn't aware that you could actually reuse some of that food. The packaged food, if, nobody, if it wasn't opened, it can be used you know, again. So, um, so that's a huge way to save on the food waste. Okay, so let's see. So building farm food infrastructure, you know, we, we tried a few programs working with farmers and trying to get surplus from the farms to institutional uh, food service providers. We know that gleaning goes on and that's really good also where people go out and the farmers got too much and it's just going to go to waste. But we are, have mostly been focusing on programs where we pay the farmers because we feel like in the long run from a sustainable solution, it's not really sustainable to think that a farmer could just give away their produce. So we've been trying to develop solutions where the farmer could actually get paid for that surplus, um, mostly involving putting it into products that you could then sell. There's a really great product that was developed locally. I don't know if you've seen Harvest Maine. But they are using all sorts of seconds, produce seconds, to make like a hummus. It's, I just talk about it, it's like a main hummus. And, you know, I think they combine beets and carrots as one version. You know, it's just a lot of the whatever was in surplus, and they make it into these delicious spreads. So it's that kind of, it's actually, there's a whole new industry called upcycled food, which is based on this concept of you re, trying to utilize food that's grown. So that's our solution for 
and then. Um, one thing that is still sort of part of the solution for, but is trying to connect the pieces of the food system. So we have a graduate student who's um, in GIS mapping, and she is working on putting this map together where you can see where the food producers are, where the food processors are, where the consumer markets and the retailers are, and then finally where you have food recycling opportunities, composting or anaerobic digestion, and then going back to the farm. And so the idea is that if we want to build a circular food system, you should be able to put your uh, area code in, you know, zip code in here and find out what does your, you know, food system look like within a 30 mile radius of your house. You know, how could you, if you have these food scraps and you want to get them to go somewhere good, you know, are there farms and things where you could bring them? So that's the GIS map, but not finished yet, still in development. Oops. And then we have a food donation toolkit. So if you know any businesses that, you know, they're not really doing it because they're not really sure, I'm not sure how to donate food. Oh, maybe if I don't want to make anybody sick and get sued. Um, this food donation toolkit clarifies, and we actually have an update because a lot of people don't know, but in the last legislative session back in November, federally, there was actually a piece of food donation, important piece of food donation legislation that made it even more, uh, encouraged even further food donation. So if you go on our website, you can find this toolkit. It, it explains to you why you will never be prosecuted because of the Good Samaritan law. So as long as you're donating food in good conscience that you don't want to make people sick, um, you cannot be held liable. There's also uh, tax credits that you can get based on the retail value of your product. You can get that as a tax credit for donating food. So there's, you know, and like I said, as of November, there's even more sort of um, benefits to food donation. So this you can find on our website. And um, community food recycling. So this has been a pretty active program of ours. You know, it is at the compo, it is solution six. So it's further down the hierarchy, but you know, a city like Portland did not actually have a free uh, program for where people could drop off food scraps. So we were going to go into the Portland schools and teach the students about, you know, not wasting food. But then we realized, oh, we're going to be teaching them, but they can't go home and like have a place to you do food scraps. So we started a pilot with Portland, um, I think five locations. They're now up to, I think, eight or nine locations. The city has responded fantastically. Um, you know, $1.2 million. Well, we did it. We extrapolated it. It would be $1.2 million in savings for Maine. But even the reduction, they are saving money in Portland on their uh, disposal costs and, of course, helping to reduce emissions. So it's been great. We have four other pilot communities that we're working if they aren't saving money, they're at least breaking even. And the whole trick to making these kinds of programs work for a community is participation. I think that there's, when we ran the numbers, if you can get probably 25 at the high end, if you can get 25% of your city participating in this, you will save money versus the tipping cost for taking your trash to the landfill. So it's, you know, and for some towns, you know, if you get 10%, yours break even. So it's, um, it's something that we're trying to encourage cities. We have a whole, we, we provide the artwork for the signage, so we have all the materials for you to take up this community food recycling also available um, on our website to take a look at. And then, oh, this is the Portland data. Um, well, I won't take you through all of it, but trust me, the chart, the, it goes up because they're saving money. It's good for them. And then, you know, basically the next steps to ending food waste in Maine, you know, to make it simple, you know, if you start tracking and measuring your own household food waste, you know, that's probably the easiest way to start reducing right in your home. It's where the most waste comes from. Um, share food waste education with other people. So you, of course, by showing up tonight, you know, you're a step ahead of others, but it'd be really great to share this information with as many people as you possibly can. Um, usually when people learn about it, it's just a fact that they don't really understand or know that this is a problem, but once you can educate them, they can take action. Um, you know, do what you can, you know, if there's one piece of that food, you know, one of the solutions that you really like, you know, try to be the champion for that in your community, whether it's donation, whether it's rescue, or whether it's those community collection sites. Um, and then, you know, I, I think that's sort of the lead in for what you're going to talk about next, but look at opportunities to integrate food waste and your climate action 
planning because they, they really fit together nicely and they are both important. So that is, um, you know, and we would invite you all because we're going to have a special section just about that at our Food Waste Summit, which is on April 14th. It's a virtual summit. And so um, we'll make sure that you have the links for that and maybe can share them through your group. So anyway, that's the presentation. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, does any does anybody have any questions? I noticed. My, yeah, I noticed that on your sponsors or your partners' uh, slide, you had Lewiston Schools, and it was the only school department that you had. Uh, do you have new ones now, or how did? What well, did they actually, do? I would say that the first two, because they are the ones who participated in our first, when we started out this work, we did a working group, and we um, brought people that were interested in the topic together to ask them what they thought the solutions would be. And so the nutrition director for Lewiston Schools, and also the nutrition director for Portland Public Schools were the two that, that were interested in being part of this discussion. Luckily for us, the person who was the nutrition director for Portland Public Schools, Jane McLucas, is now the state head of the nutrition, and that's why we have this study going on with the Department of Education, because of her. She was interested when she was there in Portland, and she's definitely interested in encouraging all of the nutrition directors statewide to get involved in it. And, you know, I would be remiss, you know, it's not just about reducing the food waste that she, you know, that her job is nutrition. And so, you know, because it would be very easy, you would probably waste a lot less food if we just served all the kids Oreos and, you know, Twinkies and Kool-Aid for lunch. I probably wouldn't waste that much. But of course, that's not what the point is. And so our study is twofold. It's one to reduce the waste, but we're actually also measuring our the uptake in the nutrition. By We did a food waste audit, so we're looking at the composition and how much was fruits and vegetables. Normally, of course, they're, unfortunately, they're the largest. About 60% of that food waste in a school is the fruits and vegetables. So we want to see over the course of the study and the way that we're handling it that kids, that the, the fruits and vegetables do not continue to be such a great proportion of the kids will be eating it instead of throwing it away because they're mandated. So, so they can't just, you know, get around it by choosing not to eat it. So they will have to eat it. And we just hope that over the course of the study that they're, you know, they are actually consuming it instead of it ending up in the food waste bin. So, so yeah. And we've actually talked, I think, probably through Valley's efforts uh, to Freeport also about being part of this work. And I think there was some interest. It's been hard to, this, there's a lot more nutrition directors who would want to do it, but the labor issues in the cafeterias are really problematic. And so it's not at the ideal time in some school districts to take on a study like this because you have enough issues just trying to keep it staffed, so. Yeah, I will agree with that, especially since now that all the children get free lunch and free breakfast. Uh, the demands on the staff in the cafeteria are just off the charts. Uh, but I also wanted to ask you about stigma, cultural stigma attached to cleaning your plate. I noticed that that is an issue, especially in this country, where um, it seems that people look down upon others who don't leave some food in the plate. Have you noticed that? And are there any ways to address that? Well, you know, that it may be, but I'm not familiar with that, you know, I guess because how I was raised, like, you didn't leave food on your plate, like, you don't waste anything. So, and I think that, like I said, we, we've just been working with the kids. I mean, I just was driving all over and doing all this work. And I don't think that that, it didn't seem to be, and I was working in different schools with very different sort of backgrounds of the kids in the different schools. And I don't think it was that they felt like they shouldn't. They were very happy. It, the real tricks were this confusion over, and that's why I have a slide in the kids program that's called, what is a meal? And I literally did this little thing where I brought the tray and I have these little samples of what they were gonna see in the cafeteria that day. And I would say like, okay, is this a meal? Yes or no? I'd ask the class, oh yeah, that's a meal. No, 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 it's not actually, you know, you need three. Okay, like then I'd load it all up and I'd forget the fruits and vegetables, you know. So a lot of the confusion, and this came from the teachers, they said they knew why the kids were wasting and that was a piece of it. And then also this thing of serving and require, and a lot of times the kitchen staff really thought they had to give the kid everything that was at lunch had to be on the tray. So 
one is we made it offer, okay, nothing has to be, you can offer them and the students need to be able to pick the fruit or vegetable they want and pick if they want the entree or they don't want the entree, they want the milk instead and they want, you know, maybe one of the side options. So, you know, that those things really were the ones leading to and not having a share basket. Okay, I made a mistake and I got the stuff. Now what do I do with it? I'm definitely not eating it. And so having this option where they can put that food into the share basket so it could actually be reused again or donated um, or, you know, other kids in the lunchroom, you know, can, can take advantage of it if they want it. So, so those were the things that really helped. And, um, and actually in some schools, you know, they give like the little stickers. They have like the clean plate club. And so I didn't see anything that seemed to be encouraging of that. Um, so, I mean, I think the nutrition director who's been doing this a long time and things we couldn't do because we just tried not to bother the schools too much, but maybe moving a lunch after recess has shown to be really effective in a lot of studies because, you know, one is otherwise lunch is just the first time they get to be social. So instead of eating, they're like talking with each other. So if you let them go to recess first, one thing is of course they have the physical activity that makes them more hungry to eat. And two, they've already had a chance to visit with their friends. Now they're ready to sit down and eat their lunch. But you know, again, we're mindful of these times that we're working with schools and they've got a lot going on. So we tried to do the interventions that would be the least disruptive to the school and still effective. So, any other? I'm sorry. Well, anyway, I, I hope this was helpful, and I really appreciate your interest in it and, and for you having me here. So, thank you. Uh, so, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to thank Suzanne for that um, great presentation. Um, uh, it's really good because she gave a really good snapshot of a lot of the um, data points. And um, I'm, oh, looks like I lost my signal. I'm going to talk uh, mostly about. Um, how uh, at EcoMaine and we collect uh, food waste in Southern Maine and some of the systems that we put that through. Um, like I said, um, thank you for having me. My name is uh, Nate Cronauer. I'm an environmental educator at EcoMaine. Um, and this uh, presentation, we just kind of call it Compost 101, or um, well, you know, what do we do about our food waste? So I'll start with some um, background information about EcoMain. Um, we are uh, located in Portland, and we service about 73 uh, municipalities, so towns and cities around Maine, um, accepting their trash, recycling, um, both, or um, we also accept some food waste, which is going to be the main topic of our um, presentation here. Um, so we basically deal with about a third of the state's uh, total waste. Um, so that's about 175,000 tons of um, regular trash, uh, about 35,000 to 40,000 tons of recycling. Um, and I will mention kind of how much uh, food waste we um, divert in the next couple slides. Um, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of those, um, those three facilities that we, uh, we operate in Portland. Oh, okay. Um, and so one of the things um, that we implement at EcoMaine is the waste hierarchy. And this was actually a framework that was developed by the Maine DEP, so the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and this is where they determine what the most um, sustainable ways to deal with our, um, our waste is. Um, and uh, Suzanne talked a lot about the um, you know, reduce and reuse elements. Um, so we start with reduction, so reducing the amount of waste that's entering the stream. Um, we use the term divert, so the goal is to divert as much waste as we can from this, um, this bottom section, which is landfill. Um, and I guess I'll, I'll read our um, mission statement really quick. It's uh, EcoMain provides comprehensive, long-term solid waste solutions in a safe, environmentally responsible, economically sound manner and is a leader in raising public awareness of sustainable waste management strategies. Um, so this is, again, this is the guideline that we use when we're making our decisions. So um, when, our, um, when we're figuring out how we're going to operate, you know, the technologies that we use, um, uh, what we implement for our own policies, so this is what we follow. And so this is kind of asking us the main question of, you know, what, what, what happens when we throw um, food into our trash? Um, and this is kind of specific to EcoMain, you know, and other facilities like EcoMain. Um, but there's really two options. If we're not, you know, composting, if we're not eating and collecting that food waste, there's really two places that food waste will end up. It's um, one, and either waste to energy, where it's being burned, um, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, or if it's in a landfill. 
So both of these things um, are not ideal for food waste. We want to um, first, uh, again, follow that um, food recovery hierarchy that Suzanne mentioned. Um, we want to feed people, um, uh, feed animals first. Um, but if we're going to um, have you know, unusable food that we can't do that with, um, we want to be making sure we're composting it, not putting it in one of these two processes. And uh, this is um, basically just a little video that's showing um, kind of a, uh, a little snapshot of um, some trash that came into EcoMain. So this is the giant claw that um, feeds the waste into, um, we have two boilers in our waste to energy facility. So one thing, um, this is actually a pretty food waste heavy load. Um, so you can kind of see uh, a couple things. I noticed that um, one, there's a lot of food waste debris that when it's all mushed together, it's a little hard to see. Um, but we know that th it's in there and we can capture it. And there's probably a lot of recyclables in there as well. Um, and again, the goal is to divert. So we're, we're reducing, reusing, we're making sure we're recycling the material we can before it enters this. Now we are a facility that um, we have acceptable and unacceptable items, but a lot of times people will come in with just household trash and we can't open up every single bag to check. I mean, there's just not enough time and work in the day to check every piece of trash that comes in. Um, so that's why one of my roles as an educator um, is to go to communities um, like Freeport and you know, one of the se all of the 73 communities, the schools, um, town events, and really kind of explain what's happening with our trash, you know, give people a good idea um, of you know, how it's processed and then um, educate with tools that we can use to help um, reduce our own waste footprint. And so um, the main thing with food waste, uh, it's very water heavy, um, and we know that water doesn't really burn in a fire. Um, these, uh, the waste energy is um, built to withstand a certain amount of moisture content. So, you know, obviously in our snow and ice that's coming in in our trash, especially around this time of year, um, you know, there, we can only account, get so much moisture out. But again, um, we'll look at how much of that um, food waste makes up, and Suzanne kind of already showed us, food waste is a lot of our um, characterization of our waste. So we want to take, if we were taking that out, we're opening up um, more space for stuff that can't be recycled, composted, or diverted. Um, and then we're also uh, reducing the inefficiencies within the waste energy. And then so we're kind of just looking at some um, symptoms of landfilling. Um, landfill, you know, we only have a certain amount of space in a landfill. Uh, waste energy, it's used to, um, you know, mainly reduce the amount of trash that's entering our landfill. Um, Ecomain's um, ash fill, it's because we take the combusted material and we landfill that in a special kind of landfill. Um, but that's been operating for the past 40 years. Um, and we have a lot of space left because of that volume reduction, as opposed to a lot of other landfills um, in the state and also beyond that, um, you know, they can only build it up a certain amount until they have to go and open up a new place, which is where they'll put all the waste. Um, so the, we're losing nutrients in that food, right? So we're growing food to, to um, give a nourishment to our, nourish our own bodies, um, and we're losing that if we're just putting it in the ground. And it's not going in the type of ground where those nutrients are going to be used again. It's going to go in a landfill. And then the methane emissions, again, Suzanne did a really good job of, you know, really stressing how serious methane is as um, a contributor to climate change and human impact on the environment. Uh, methane, you know, 26 times more potent um, of a greenhouse gas is CO2. Um, one of the largest attributors is food waste, you know, cow, um, you know, cow farming, which is, again, um, part of our food chain. So um, really reducing food waste from entering landfills is a very beneficial thing, um, you know, not only economically, but environmentally. And is this looking familiar at all? Um, this is the food waste recovery hierarchy. Um, uh, this is, again, so we start with reduction. Sorry, it's a little blurry up there. Um, but again, stressing that we're feeding people first, then we're feeding animals, and then you know, towards the end, we're um, going to compost it. Um, but again, before we dispose of it in landfilling, again, we want to capture all those nutrients, but first we want to feed people. That's where, you know, that's why we grow this food, is to feed people, not to feed our soil. We don't need our food to do that directly, um, but we want to capture it if it, if it um, isn't going to be nourishing us. And I, um, I wanted to mention, um, at EcoMain, we have our food waste storage bunker in our tipping hall, um, and that's where we actually collect um, about five to 6,000 tons of food waste um, each year mainly from producers like supermarkets, retailers, um, usually uh, um, donators that have high levels of sort of like contamination like packaging um, and other sorts of contaminants in there. So and we'll talk about that um, kind of coming up here. Oop, I'm hoping that, and we kind of have just like a little informational um, video that I'm gonna share real quick.
sort of giving you know the different um, options you have and kind of background information on home composting. That was just a good kind of um, informational blurb. Um, that's all available online, so you can certainly um, find more kind of informational videos like that. Um, but that kind of gives a good synopsis of you know, some of the techniques that you can do um, in your own backyard. Um, then again, for those of us who might not have the space to compost, some of us might not have the ability to compost. Um, again, most of us do, I want to encourage that. Um, but you know, for, for larger volumes, especially of stuff that might be you know, coming from these um, supermarkets and retailers, these are a lot of the um, composting services. Um, we Compost It has actually been, uh, is now a part of AgriCycle Energy, um, which is the um, anaerobic digestion um, and food waste uh, hauler that we send our um, food waste from our bunker to. Um, and I'll kind of explain how they use um, that process up in Ag um, Exeter, Maine. Um, so again, so, um, you know, Garbage to Garden, also great organization. A lot of these um, organizations are just really helping reduce the food waste via curbside collection. Again, so they have some um, of these food waste drop-off centers. Um, so again, sort of trying to divert that food waste. Um, so uh, I wanted to include this. This is um, the uh, depackaging auger at AgriCycle. So um, a lot of our food waste will come in packaging, in plastic bags, um, is usually pretty gross. Uh, so they send it to a depackaging auger, which um, basically just like an auger, it's kind of, it's a screw that all the food waste kind of goes in, it kind of crushes it up, and then it will separate um, kind of the liquid um, food waste from the solids left over. Um, so that's kind of, uh, as you can see, I've been to the facility up there. Um, uh, it's, it's not the best smelling operation, but again, so if we're taking that and putting it somewhere else, it really reduces a lot of that odor in our own um, homes, you know, if we are separating our compost well and keeping it out of our regular trash. Um, and so the, the remaining contamination, which is what you're um, seeing, uh, they're kind of feeding that into the auger, and then what's left over is all that kind of, you know, pla packaging and plastic stuff. That's then sent back to Ecomain um, to be put through the waste to energy. So we're not just going to landfill that. Um, we want to make sure that we're putting it through the waste to energy there. And then this is um, uh, basically kind of a good infographic of um, what happens at AgriCycle. So it's anaerobic digestion, uh, which means you're basically, um, you're removing air, which is actually um, working with the microorganisms, uh, microorganisms um, in the um, food waste that is actually going to break down and produce that methane. So this is um, something that uh, if we're going to produce the methane, which it's part of decomposing, you know, we produce methane, cows, and this decomposing food, um, you want to capture it so it's not released into the atmosphere um, sort of un, uh, unfazed or unprocessed um, because then we get the, green, uh, the greenhouse um, effects. So we take sort of our mix of um, food waste, so a mix of, you know, they, uh, they talked about sort of green and brown food wastes, um, green being more like nitrogen-rich material, like, um, you know, our rinds, our, you know, um, strawberry stems, stuff like that, mixed with the um, stuff that is uh, more carbon-rich, so like twigs and leaves and some of the, um, you know, brown paper napkin stuff. Um, and so they take that and they mix it with um, cow manure. Um, they put it into these um, big tanks, uh, which I think they have three um, giant tanks that a total volume I think is about 3.2 million gallons um, that they're um, processing, so that's quite a bit. And then um, there's really the, the byproducts or the biogas, uh, which is the methane, which they then burn to generate electricity to operate their dairy farm, um, as well as provide a little bit back um, to the grid. And then they separate um, the uh, food waste into a um, sort of biosolids material and then a more like liquid fertilizer material. Um, and then they use the biosolids as a um, bedding for the cows. So this operates on a dairy farm. Um, so they are using that biosolid um, uh, to provide kind of some yeah, bedding for the cows. And then that liquid fertilizer um, is then collected and then um, used on the farm as well. 
Um, so this is kind of more of a snapshot of windrow or sort of like backyard composting. Um, and this is um, a lot more simple um, because we just have our sort of our green uh, nitrogen rich material, our brown carbon rich material, and then we just kind of let it sit, um, let nature do its thing um, and give it some time. Of course, we don't want to just leave it sitting there because if we do, methane will be produced because the stuff, the food waste that's underneath all that um, soil or compost, if it doesn't get exposed to air or oxygen, it is going to produce that methane. So, um, you know, if anybody's seen the compost turners, you know, old pitchfork and, you know, just um, uh, mulching it up, it will definitely um, help aid the breakdown of that material. And then these are just some um, examples of some of the large kind of food waste um, windrows. Um, these are um, these used to be operated by We Composted, again now part of AgriCycle. And then I want to kind of include this um, piece of machinery. It's a windrow turner, which is a pretty cool um, you know piece of like a tractor equipment. You know you can kind of add it onto a tractor, and again so it just aids in mixing up all that material, kind of breaking it down, introducing oxygen to it, and preventing that methane buildup. And um, so it, we, we saw a little bit of it in the snapshot, but um, you know, home composting, um, uh, if many of us are familiar with that ton of top right image, um, that's kind of a simple sort of backyard static, a static pile is what we call it. So that's something that you just kind of leave out there and then kind of churn up. Um, uh, here's a compost turner, so it's something that is a little easier in like a cityscape. So it's something where you can put the food waste in, mix it all together, and give it a good turn, you know, however, um, however often you want to go out there, at least once a week. Um, to kind of keep things moving around. And then the, um, the com vermicomposting is with the aid of those um, uh, worms to help break down that food waste as well, which is really cool. Um, I want to kind of include um, a little snapshot about um, biodegradable plastics or compostable plastics. Um, we are not really a fan of these items, um, mainly because um, they don't really break down very well. You know, we've talked to a lot of the composters and. Um, they uh, take longer than expected. They take a little bit more agitation than expected. Um, so they don't break down well enough for the kind of quality that they're looking for, as well as um, we're kind of uh, taking, you know, more resources and putting it into a disposable item. So, you know, obviously we have a plastic problem, single-use plastic, um, you know, I'll come back for another talk on that because that's a whole other presentation. Um, but single-use plastics and items, you know, especially with plastic packaging, um, is a big source of pollution, a big source of um, uh, you know, uh, emissions with dealing with it. So um, you know, carry around a fork and knife if you can. Um, you know, reusable straws, reusable utensils, reusable cups. Um, you know, for those of us who need straws, right? So some of us might need straws, you know, but there's reusable options. So we don't necessarily have to take a disposable one if we can, you know, remember our, um, remember our little uh, sustainable to-go kit. Um, but so I would say that uh, it's, it's a technological fix for a problem that I think is um, not necessarily one that is as simple as just one um, type of new product to use. And then um, this, is, this is kind of a snapshot or a characterization of the average um, uh, main trash. Um, so this is sort of everything mixed together. We have you know, about 40% of the waste, you know, you know, 38 to 40% of compostable material, and then about 21% um, you know, of recycling. So here we see, again, um, you know, recycling and composting, I mean, that's, you know, that's basically 60% right there that we could divert from entering our waste stream. So you know, waste to energy, you know, we're burning that waste. We don't want to be burning waste that we don't have to burn if we can divert it by composting or recycling or reuse or all these other methods. So um, it helps reduce methane. Um, it's also can be an economic thing. Sometimes investing in these infrastructures is a bit of a cost up front, but environmentally and economically down the road, you know, I personally believe that um, the, the, these systems will pay for themselves. Um, yeah. And um, so this is, again, sort of a, a snapshot of all the different reasons of why we want to compost. Um, this was taken from the state of Maine's um, composting sort of information site as the five essentials of composting. So those are the things that you're really looking for. A lot of the industrial composters are, but also, you know, backyard composters or any, anybody who's interested. Um, you know, those are kind of the five um, elements that you really wanted to be monitoring and making sure um, that those conditions are correct to um, break your compost down in a uh, timely and um, quality manner. And so um, uh, this kind of comes to, to, you know, my role and, you know, what, are, what is EcoMain doing besides collecting that um, food waste? You know, we go out um, and 
do events like this. We go to schools a lot. Um, and we try to um, teach about composting, uh, help schools get composting um, started or even back on track. Um, Suzanne does a lot of great work with that too. We kind of um, you know, overlap in a lot of those things. Um, kind of, uh, we offered um, grants to schools, so um, about $25,000 a year we have that we um, let schools apply um, to help bolster their own infrastructure um, for uh, recycling and composting. Um, Fiddlehead School in Gray is one that I've worked with and um, has been a recipient of a grant. Um, so and there's a Westbrook schools as well. So there's a lot of um, different opportunities and I really encourage all of you to um, you know, let your uh, schools know, uh, your connections, um, to try and access this money because um, it's, there, it's there for the taking to help make these systems a little bit better. Um, you know, you can, you can kind of read this information, but we focus a lot on outreach. We focus on doing events like this um, to you know, reduce food waste in our, our trash, reduce um, contamination and recycling, all these different things that are gonna make our waste systems more environmentally friendly and economically um, stable. And um, so we also offer tours of the facility, so I recommend um, if anybody is interested, um, reach out to us anytime for a tour. And then um, we sort of have a, a tagging program for interns. I kind of wanted to mention that. It's more recycling focused, but um, there's definitely capacity there um, to kind of move into the realm of um, food waste contamination reporting. And um, uh, real quick, Recyclopedia is an app. It's a free app that um, anybody can use. It's also online. Um, we have stuff about food waste in there even. So you, know, you can ask, is a, a bowling ball recyclable? Or you know, what do I do with a banana peel? And it will tell you, you know, find a composting service and kind of give you a list of options um, to, to find the best way to discard of your waste. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, at, from anybody. Yeah. How much electricity is produced in your uh, Portland facility? So um, we generate about, um, we use the term like 15,000 homes worth of electricity. So the average usage of a single home, um, we generate about um, 15,000. So that's kind of the, um, uh, the flux of what we produce. We also power all three of our facilities, and then that 15,000 homes worth is additional. Um, we're uh, about a 14 megawatt um, facility, so we can average you know, from 12 to 14 megawatts. Um, yep. Thank you. Thanks. Great presentation. Um, I love that you guys are partnering with AgriCycle you know, and, and doing the auger thing and taking the removable waste. I understand there's another digester that started up in Clinton, Maine, which is, there's a sort of a little nidus of uh, dairy community farms that wanted to have some kind of way to offset their carbon footprint and also accommodate a lot of similar types of waste. Do you know anything about that or is there another partnership happening with other landfills that might be closer to that, Juniper Ridge or something like that? And then I have a second question. Oh, um, that I do not know about um, other organizations that partner with um, that specific um, anaerobic digester. Yeah, it makes sense. It kind of started with dairy farms because of the excess manure that they had, which is obviously a big part of the process, and also just um, you know thinking of their own kind of disposal costs and use of that fertilizer as well. So um, I'm not familiar with that specific one, but I will definitely um, look into that. Yeah. And may I ask another Absol question? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I am, I'm sure everybody's heard of the sort of PFAS challenges that our state is undergoing currently. And I'm curious, is there, has that produced some new hurdles for you guys in screening waste for PFAS contamination? Or is that something that you already were familiar with, et cetera? Yeah, PFAS is kind of um, the, the big issue, um, especially with kind of uh, food waste. And, you know, obviously, um, well, for those who might not know, um, PFAS is uh, an, kind of a forever chemical um, that is really, really hard. They use it in um, water repellent, um, uh, so like waterproofing, coating. Um, it's kind of found in there. So it's um, also really, really hard to get rid of. Um, so I think statewide, um, everybody's sort of handling this challenge. Um, I've been to a couple conferences recently where that's definitely been, you know, the, the question that was asked a lot the most. And um, there's a lot of people who are on that, but as far as a clear solution on the best way to deal with that, the jury's a bit out. Um, you know, we have certain things um, that we are looking at to go in the future, um, but um, as of right now, I don't know of anything specific other than, you know, one stop, putting 
PFAS and, and products um, that will eventually end up in the waste stream. Um, but as far as a treatment method, um, there's a, something called pyrolysis. That's something that's being looked into. Um, you know, I'll let you kind of look. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, so I'll let you look into that. But um, that's definitely a solution. So if you have the, if you know anybody with the solution, um, they they might have the next uh, billion dollar idea there. So, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't provide more of an answer to that. Uh, I have a question about the waste to energy too. Um, so, well, it feels like, and we read that recycling isn't really scalable within the state of Maine, like just hauling truckloads of empty plastic cartons or whatever, just it, it's not gonna work in a state like Maine and much of the country, frankly. How scalable could the waste to energy plants be? I mean, we have the, the Hampton plant that is ready to go, but nobody wants to fire it up, nobody can own it. Does EcoMaine have any intentions or does, do they have any thoughts about expanding statewide or, or bigger? Um, I think um, as far as expansion, I mean, we, we definitely will take new communities. So there's, um, you know, some towns and cities will be like, hey, you know, usually if it's through the education department or through, you know, word of mouth is very, very big in Maine and very effective. Um, so people kind of get word of EcoMaine, kind of what we do. Um, so they might reach out to us. And that's kind of something that um, I encourage you, you know, as residents of, you know, the town of Freeport and, and beyond to get involved into your own town um, council meetings because that's something where it's like a decision made by like a town manager or a town council um, and I always say that uh, a waste disposal is one of the biggest um, portions of your tax dollars so it's definitely something to be involved in and sort of be aware of what's going on so you can maybe make a little bit more informed decisions you know I'm, I'm here to help you know with those answers but um, that would be something where we do we do have towns and cities sign on and sending their trash recycling in both um, that's not something that I personally deal with um, but Waste to energy, waste to energy expansion throughout the state. So, I'm, I'm acknowledging that it's not going to pay for for Fort Fairfield to truck their recycling down to to South Portland. So, why not open up more waste to energy plants throughout the state? It may, it's maybe not your purview, but no, does Aiko mean want to do that? Thank you. No, that's um, yeah, that's. Uh, kind of clarifies. Um, I think Maine, um, there's a couple, so there's Penobscot Energy Recovery, there's a couple um, waste energy facilities. Maine is a relatively small state, um, so you know we have, a, what's our population? I think it's 1.6 million, 1.8 million. It's getting a little higher, but it's still, I mean, let's I think of New York City. I always kind of throw that as an example. Um, a place like New York City can have large recycling um, facilities, you know, glass recycling facilities, because they have the volume of waste to, um, process, but also the it's close by, right? It's a little bit more focused. Maine is a very spread out state, um, so it doesn't, you know, why some towns and cities have stopped recycling completely is because it was a fiscal decision where they said, we don't want to pay to have to either truck it all this way or, you know, waste to energy. Um, plants are expensive to build, absolutely. I mean, they are very, very costly. Um, so it, as far as building a, another facility, kind of another eco main facility, that um, would be challenging. Um, but also, I think, um, again, my, you know, my opinion, I think we only really need, you know, one or two waste energy facilities in Maine to handle the volume. Um, I, that's just because, again, if we invest more in food waste diversion, more recycling, because a lot of the waste that, again, is going into these landfills up in, up in Maine are recyclable, are food waste. It's just cheaper to do so. So that's kind of one of the main reasons. But as far as why we don't expand, I mean, we, we do... Um, outreach and we do, um, you know, communities that want to send us their waste, you know, we'll definitely work with them and, and try to get more communities on board. Um, but um, yeah, we just our own, you know, capacity and limitations as well. I'm just wondering if you can speak to the environmental impacts, whether that's emissions or how, how you see that comparing something like composting and a system like AgriCycle agri with not picking on them, but the digesters do you mean uh, like the wa like waste energy emissions? yeah waste at waste energy emission I mean if if one were to say I have X amount of food scraps I can compost this or I can send it to a digester what am I looking at with a difference in environmental impact 
I think um, if you can backyard compost or do like a more um, a windrow separated compost, that's really good. Again, so anaerobic digestion and composting, it's on the very bottom of that recovery hierarchy. Um, so I would, you know, you ideally would not have to use the resources to digest it if you could divert it in another way where you, again, sort of use like a backyard system. Um, again, the uh, maybe for like waste of energy to kind of compare, um, our emissions are about 96% CO2 and water vapor and then 4% of the other stuff. Um, I can kind of mention some of the pollution control methods that um, we put uh, through the waste energy through. Um, one is um, it's called an electrostatic precipitator, um, which is basically a um, like a series of kind of metal curtains or plates that are charged, and they attract a lot of particulate. Um, the main goal is to take as much of the bad stuff in the trash that's being burned and um, isolate it within the ash. So we're trying to take as much of that out of the actual emissions that are going out of the tower and isolate it um, with lime slurry. So that's something that will neutralize more acidic natures in the ash. Um, we add a substance called urea, which helps control like nitrogen oxide. So there's a lot of you know bad stuff in our products and, and these items that we want to be taking out. Um, so that's, that's, that's a little bit more of the waste of energy side. So we, are mon so we monitor for those pollutants as well. Um, but as far as the, um, I don't have anything specific on the anaerobic digestion side of like if you divert this amount of food waste, you're kind of um, taking out this amount of methane, if that's sort of what you're asking. Yeah, I mean, just general questions, so thank you. I was wondering about um, uh, industrial composting or windrow composting and um, for Freeport, um, if we were to push to get more involved with uh, having a composting system, uh, are there existing systems that we could feed or would we need to uh, have a f some land that we would set up with these windrow kinds of systems or how, what, what would be our option for that? Um, yeah, so the options would be um, a lot of those companies that I sort of, um, and I, maybe I can even kind of go back here um, to the snapshot with a bunch of them. So a lot of these are more commercial collectors, so they'll collect, um, some do curbside pickup, like garbage to garden, um, you know, you kind of like will buy that bucket, you set it out on the, the curbside, and they'll come to you and pick up like a normal kind of trash collection truck. Um, I think uh, the town would have that option to either do contracts with them for either like a curbside system. The town could, you know, do their own system as well. Um, that's probably a little more costly. It might be easier to go with one of these um, uh, companies that's already kind of doing that. Um, or, uh, again, mostly what we get in our food waste bunker is the stuff that's more challenging to compost. So I kind of, in a snapshot earlier, it was, um, you know, you, don't, you want to keep your, your meat, your dairy out of your backyard compost. Um, and that's one of the advantages, I guess, for the industrial composting and anaerobic digestion is let's, again, even, even in our compost, let's compost everything that we can out of an, the industrial system first. And then the stuff that we really can't, like the gross packaging that is rotten cream in a con carton and, you know, um, meat eggs, bones, stuff that we don't want sitting, attracting pests and diseases and bacteria in our own backyard compost, we're still able to divert that and not have those be contributing to the methane and all those other things. Um, uh, so it would probably be either through a collection service like that, or if your town, um, a lot of towns are having food waste interns, um, which is really good. Um, I've worked with a couple of them, and I mean, having one person dedicated to food waste, I think is really beneficial because, again, it's such a huge part of our own waste characterization, so. Because actually we would like to see, it. that's solution six, and the best of the solutions for diversions is actually to have the town do their own composting on site. And there's a lot of towns, um, uh, Skowhegan, I think, has been a real success story. Lincoln County is doing their own, and we set up, I think, Cumberland. I know that we did some um, sessions. You know, basically, you just need to have the space to do it. You collect. What's so great about it is you're not trucking your uh, food waste around the state to anybody else's location. You're doing it right in your area, and then when you're composting, you're getting the nutrients for the soil in your area. Or the, you know, the residents take it home. Yes. So it's a really great system, and there's all sorts of help from the DEP to do that work. So if you guys 
very interested. I don't know if you have the space to do it, but it's, that is the number one solution actually for um, diversion is to do your own uh, municipal composting. And that's a great point because uh, the waste industry is very reliant upon trucking. So that's something that is, you know, the more local that we can make these systems, you know, we're not spending the fossil fuels, the money in fuel costs. I mean, as we all know, cost of fuel has gone up exponentially, which is translates over to the cost of waste processing and all this stuff. So yeah, more locally is the best way to reduce the cost and reduce the emissions. Yeah, I just, the question is how much space do you need for a certain population? Because the school district here in the area has also been talking about trying to do more compost and get composting more into more of the schools. And it just seems like trying to do it locally would be great because it, you, you have the whole visual of it happening here, so there, there's more buy-in and feedback just from the local population and all of the people involved, instead of shipping it off somewhere and then, yeah. You know, it's, we have a chart, actually, that shows um, from a different presentation that I have, but the amount of cost savings for the community is really highest. I mean, Reedfield is a, a town that's doing one of the pilots now, and they have started doing that, collecting it. They have it at their transfer station. They, you need to bring in some manure sources, or in the summertime, you use your lawn clippings. And, and actually, the DEP has a very, you know, like, they have a lot of help to give you this information. If you're already collecting... Um, the yard scraps in your at your transfer, you know, it's it's sort of the next step. You've already got part of, you know, Nate knows this better. Whatever that recipe is for composting, but you know, you've got a good start on it. If you have some manure sources, you know, in your community, that's the other piece that you need. And a lot of times they're looking to offload it anyway, so they bring it to your site. And it's really terrific, um, to, like you said, to get the community involved because everyone can benefit then in the springtime, you have this great compost to use in your gardens. So, but yeah, I mean, the amount of savings, you know, at every level, like Nate was saying, you're not trucking it, you know, you're keeping it local and, you know, and the, also the DEP, if you can only do your community at your site, you don't have enough room. The schools, they really wanted us to start a program to help each school do composting on site because that is very doable. The amount of food scraps they're collecting in the cafeteria sort of somehow matches usually the available space to do a school garden and then you're using that compost right there. So, I mean, that's, that's a, um, a solution that we're looking at trying to sponsor as well. So, but yeah, it's all... I mean, yeah, and it's very beneficial to have the students doing it because, I mean, it's not only learning about accountability, responsibility, resource management, but, you know, there's life sciences, there's biology in there. So when um, we get, you know, schools um, doing their own compost pile, I mean, it's making all these different connections, um, you know, showing a greater cycle that we're kind of all a part of. So that's a big, uh, a big thing. Composting should be in every school <laughs> as a, a course at least or... And um, any questions about um, reci anything recycling or, you know, um, beyond compost, but, you know, focusing mostly on compost. If uh, question on um, recycling of different uh, plastics and glass and whatnot. Um, where, where do they go once, once you uh, separate them? Uh, are there places in Maine that, um, that uh, produce them into new products, or do they have to go out of Maine? and and what would help, um, you know, with the circular economy uh, to, um, to make it more uh, economically profitable to recycle and, and uh, you know, keep a, a better system going? Yeah, I think um, as far as where, where the recycling goes, it changes. Recycling markets are very... Um, they kind of go up and down. They're sort of cyclical in a way that, you know, they start at a high point, they end up kind of going to a low point, and then a lot of different factors, so cost of fuel, um, even socio-political stuff like, you know, um, issues with Russia and Ukraine, stuff like that, Tra uh, um, you know, supply chain, that's what I was looking for, supply chain issues. So the markets are affected in a lot of different ways. 
Um, we'll send them to places like, so I can, for example, um, paperboard, so like cardboard, um, Quebec. We send a lot to Quebec, um, New York, Wisconsin. So there's not, um, again, and so Maine's a small state, so um, the buyers of this material in the volumes that we're, you know, we take them and we crush the recycling up into big cubes and then, you know, load them onto tractor trailers and send them off to the, the, the buyers. Um, the buyers are usually demanufacturing facilities, so that's, uh, that's where they take it. Um, they'll pulp up the paper. So they'll make new paper pulp and then make new paper board, or um, they'll flake the plastic. So like PET plastic, HDPE number two plastic um, will be chipped or flaked um, and then sold like that to places that will then either um, like melt them down and extrude them or um, uh, they can use um, air and molds to like uh, blow form them. So um, uh, there's a lot of plastics can go to Connecticut, Alabama, um, and so there's really a lot of different places. Um, ideally, if we had markets in Maine that we could sell it to, I guarantee you we would be, um, but uh, it's uh, really dependent on um, the manufacturing facilities that need the recycled content. So the goal is po post-consumer recycled content. Um, but that being said, you know, recycling, I think, uh, may in the past have been sort of portrayed as this kind of solution that will save our climate and save our planet. Um, I assure you that's not the case, but again, recycling, um, it's resource management, right? We're teaching accountability that we can't just um, take something and we throw it away and it just goes magically away. Um, so it's important to recycle metal, recycle paper. Um, you know, plastic recycling has its issues, absolutely, um, but there's still um, markets for a lot of those plastics that we get. So that's why, that's why we collect it and recycle it. Well, I just want to thank both of you on behalf of Freeport Sustainability Board for coming and giving this amazing presentation. Yeah, super helpful, super didactic. Um, so thank you so much. We will make sure that it's broadcast on the cable channel locally, and then with your permission, we will uh, put the lecture and the slides on YouTube, and that's how we advertise the lecture beyond here, if that's amenable to both of you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, if I could just make one one last sort of uh, plug. We do have um, an Earth Day event coming up um, mm -hmm. called EcoFest. Um, if any of you are familiar with the EcoMain open house that we've done, um, where there's electronic recycling, um, different vendors and venues of sustainable waste management companies in Maine, um, that's something that we did in the past. COVID kind of put us on hiatus, but um, we're actually gonna have um, EcoFest. It's gonna be at the um, North Yarmouth Community Center, um, uh, April 22nd on Earth Day, so that's a Saturday. Um, I believe it's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., so it's kind of a all ages family event, um, and we really would encourage people to go. It's gonna have a lot of cool sustainable waste stuff going on there, so. That's great. If you can send that information to us, Absolutely. we will make sure yeah. to distribute it to our list, too. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And before everyone goes, very quick reminder that we have the vulnerability uh, workshop coming up for the Climate Action Plan. I think everyone here is already familiar with what's going on, but the one thing that I wanted to say is that we have a tentative date of May 4th uh, for that workshop and that we will be presenting with GPCOG uh, the baseline for the greenhouse gas, gas emissions inventory and we will also be presenting their models and findings for vulnerabilities that are related to climate change in this town, both on the coastline and uh, low-lying areas. And at that workshop, we will be uh, hopefully getting a lot of feedback about what people are seeing on the ground and also what kind of um, preference they have for setting uh, greenhouse gas emission levels and targets moving forward. So that's May 4th, but we will send all that information out via email together with the information about the day. Thank you so much, everyone. Take a cookie on your way home. Yeah. <laughs>